Welcome to the Directions Mag Geo Inspirations podcast series with Joseph Kursky. Greetings, all. Joseph Kursky here with you on another episode of the Geo Inspirations podcast series with Directions Magazine. The Geo Inspirations. I know that's a that's a big phrase, but the idea is to feature inspiring people that are making a positive difference in our planet through the application of spatial thinking and geotechnologies and science and and much more. And today, I'm so excited about this because I've got Dr. Alex Philp with me. Alex, welcome. Thank you, Joseph. Good to be here. Well, I appreciate the fact that I know how I have a, a slight inkling not a full inkling, a slight inkling of how busy you are and how busy you have always been ever since I've known you for 20 plus years now. But if you could, for the benefit of the listeners here, describe your current position or maybe positions. Yeah, Joseph, again, thank you for inviting me to this event and this, this dialogue. Currently, I'm new to a company called the MITRE Corporation. And I work as a senior principal scientist at the MITRE Corp. The MITRE Corporation is a nonprofit uh, headquartered in McLean, Virginia, Bedford. Started in 1958, been working on really, really hard problems for the government for a long time. I was hired into their research division called MITRE Labs. I think it's the fifth largest industrial research center in the country. You know, you can compare it to Microsoft Research, IBM Research, Intel Corporation, whatever. So 3,000 scientists and engineers. I work in the Emerging Technologies Innovation Center. Like academia, we're broken into centers and departments and groups. And the group I'm within, um, as a geographer, which is a little wild, is I'm, I'm with the department that focuses on biotech, nanotech, and quantum tech. So really hard stuff, very advanced convergence, and sort of similar to my career as an interloper, as an interdisciplinarian, as a whatever, I guess as a geographer, um, I'm in full learn mode again. That's my primary responsibility. Uh, secondarily, I serve on a number of boards for the National Forest, the Museum of National Forest History, for the U.S. Forest Service, we're trying to build a museum to capture the history of the American forest conservation effort. I uh, serve on some environmental and or conservation groups at a very local level. And then I am a senior research fellow for the Office of Vice President of Research at the University of Montana here in, in Missoula. So that's what I'm, that's what I'm currently doing. As I suspected, you've got many different roles and positions and things you're curious about. Before I totally leave this subject, I, I, I'm always learning new things about you, Alex, but that forest history, did we talk about this in the past? One of the most influential books to me that I've read in the past decade or so has been The Big Burn about the 1910 Idaho-Montana fires. Yeah. Yeah. Did you read that book? I love that. Oh yeah, book. it's yeah. all about for the benefit of the listener, Pinchot and Roosevelt and the birth of the Forest Service, and about should we let things burn or should we just should we have fire, uh, you know, suppression? Kind of is it's a hundred year, hundred and ten years old. I mean, the story, but it's remarkably pertinent to today, isn't it? With all of the natural uh, hazards and disasters and wildfires issues that we've got nowadays. The fire, the big burn of 1910, the summer of 1910 was, was, catas- was catastrophic. It was uh, pivotal in changing and forming, in many ways, U.S. Forest Service policy to fire. It, it defined more than 100 years of our perception of wildland fire across landscapes. And there is a lot, there's a lot to that. Um, but, you know, our, the story of the Pulaski the people that died in um, Wallace, Idaho, uh, you know, what, what big fires look like uh, with the right factors. I, as, as an old forestry guy, um, having worked for the Forest Service and studied forestry and, and looked at landscape change over time. I mean, that's the theme, that's something that interests me as a historian, 
geographer. I, I'm fascinated by landscapes, particularly watershed units. I don't, I don't know why I gravitate to rivers and watershed units, but they're natural. They're a great way to define ecosystem services and functions and structure and composition. Long story short, if anybody takes the most basic look at the landscape, I don't care if it's a prairie, Amazon rainforest, northern temperate forest, boreal forest, you, you, know, you start to learn about these disturbance regimes. What, what is a disturbance and what do we mean by that? And how do, how do landscapes transform? How do energy budgets move over? How, how, how are these processes working? And fire, as Stephen Pine and many, many others have written, is, is, a, is a fundamental force of nature, if you will, but it had human relationship to fire, as we've learned anthropologically and archeologically, has been a dominant tool, right? For mm -hmm. landscape modification and landscape, human, you know, anthropogenic modification of landscapes. I think the longer we look at the archaeological record, every week there's a greater sense of how pyrotechnics have played a role. I'm fascinated by the avalanche regime, by the flood regime, by the fire regime, by thing, by insect infestation and, and how species, entire species, right? The lodgepole pine, western larch, ponderosa, giant sequoia, whatever. I'm fascinated by how fire isn't just an aberration, but as we learned in 19, if you, if you counter, if you juxtapose 1988 and the Yellowstone fires mm -hmm. with where we were in 1910 and the, and the beginning of the discussion on conservation and saving our forests, it's, it's remarkable how in that 78 year period, the, the park service began to implement that let burn approach and then we had this sort of recursive knee-jerk reaction to, I think, our emotional response to landscapes. You know, the idea that I think we're, we get caught up, as many people have written, I don't have all the author names at the tip of my tongue, but the idea of wildness and wilderness and the idea of the untrammeled and that which is devoid of man or human impact, that, that is, that's much harder for us to understand and define today. So a lot of our you know, Wilderness in the American Mind, Nash's book and others, a lot of our understanding of that which is supposedly virgin, untrammeled, uh, a lot that came into the romantic basis of the, you know, the Wilderness Act, all that, the wildland fires of Yellowstone of 88, and I was there, I was fighting fire in Cook City for the National Park Service. It was a turning point in that we let fire we let note the words we we did not intervene in a transformation of large stand replacement lodgepole pine forests in that yellowstone caldera and the high mountain plateau and if you go back now so let's go 40 years later and you go back to yellowstone national park and you look at what two and a half million acres of burn looks like it is a massive regeneration and explosion of energy, of, of carbon sequestration at extreme rates. And again, so Joseph, to your point, um, many people, our relationship to fire has, was important in the late Pleistocene. It became a dominant tool of the early Holocene and, and elements of the harnessing of fire within you know, proto-civilization and then early civilization. And now here we are. 2021, I guess what I would say in a very long-winded response to a very great question is that we, we are now going in many parts of the world, and certainly in the Western United States, as you know, we are having to reassess our relationship to fire, to fire, you know, smoke days. I, in Missoula, where I live, I just came out of 47 days of unhealthy air quality, you know, in a five-month period. So, the as the world is rebalancing energy equations and you know and we we're, we're we're dealing with a warming effect and we're dealing with changes in hydrological cycles and biogeophysical cycles and all these things the baseline that we have known in the last 10,000 years that which we look to for our understanding of historical averages you'll often hear outside the range of historical variability 
Well, as, as somebody who likes, who likes paleoecological thinking or paleobiogeography, I don't care what you call it, our very understanding of what history is, the baseline by which we judge our past and therefore know our future is changing. So we have a lot of anomalies, right? Statisticians talk about anomalies, like we've got a thousand year flood event every three years, blah, 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 blah. blah. So fire is, is a really important process. And as we demonized it in 1910, I think we, we run the risk now as we look at different fire regimes and changing regimes, altering regimes, we run the risk as stewards, as land managers, as so-called policymakers, as citizens of reacting naively to changing landscapes at scale. And, you know, you'll, you'll, you know to, to sum up, it's not about raking the forests. It's not about just harvesting timber to reduce fuels. It, there's, there's much more going on. And I think we, we have to calibrate our emotional response, our psychology to landscapes. And then ultimately, I'm saying as never before that active management of, our, of these protected lands, these conserved lands, the, the, the efforts of Pinchot, our legacy requires us now more than ever to come together as stewards, as citizens of the commons and actively manage these landscapes for a variety of competing objectives. Anyway, it's, it, you, know, you can just take fire. You can light that. I could uh, fill up your entire interview here talking about it, but it's- I was just gonna say this, this alone is a great topic that we could have a whole interview chat about, but hopefully we're, we're planting some seeds in the listener that actually touches on some of the things that I was actually going to ask you and you've already touched on them. The role of a geographer in all of this, like for example, at your MITRE labs and your perspectives on landscape change and planning. And it also touches on what I hope comes through with this discussion for the listener, and that is don't ignore historical artifacts, books written about historical events. Be well-read. Be well-read in a well-rounded way. Read fiction. Read nonfiction. Read is the point, right? We'll learn a lot of lessons from from history alone uh, with, with that kind of perspective. I know when I met you, I was at USGS. We talked a lot about the old drawings and maps of John Wesley Powell. And you know, just reminded me of that anew and afresh of his design for political administrative areas around watersheds. And you know, one wonders what he would have thought about some of the shapes of our counties and states <laughs> now, uh, 130 years later. But uh, that's another discussion I, I love what you're saying. And behind me, I know that the benefit of the li- for the benefit of the listener, Alex and I are, we've got our cameras on. You all are just listening to a podcast. Alex has got a map of Montana with watersheds and physical features behind him. I've got a photograph of that I took of the Western Colorado, uh, my homeland. So we're, we're both grounded in the, the physical environment, but we are also very keen on inspiring you, the listener, to blaze your own pathway. So I know that Alex, you're always, you've always been a forward thinking, innovative person. And that's one of the reasons why I love chatting with you and have loved chatting with you for these years. If you could just ever so briefly describe how did you journey, you touched on a little bit of the things that you'd done in the past, but how did you journey to where you are now? I mean, what are the, some of the things that maybe stand out as things you're very proud of being involved with? over the course of these years? I know that's kind of a tall order for a, for a two minute reflection, but uh, if you could, it just so that people say, gosh, you know, there are many pathways into making a positive difference on our planet. What is Alex's pathway? I, I was fortunate, I believe that I, I did grow up in a home that encouraged learning and reading. My dad was driven by knowledge I grew up in a home that was intellectually curious, and I, I benefited by great teachers. Uh, one stands out at Seattle U, where I did my undergrad in ancient Greek history and philosophy. 
so I realized that a lot of what we deal with is repetitive in human nature. And we, we change the context and we change the, the, the outcomes, but we were human nature and our predicament and the question, the, the fundamental questions remain the same. McClowski exposed me to environmental science, thinking um, bioregionally, biogeographically, and, and that propelled me into a career coming out of high school, great, great science teacher then into college, right into the National Park Service and Glacier National Park. So a large part of the last 30 years have been defined by my years as a ranger in Glacier, on the ground, trying to balance the equation of the balancing act of preserve the park in all of its wonder, all of its processes, you know, structure, function, composition. Also starting off as a ranger naturalist and leading people literally in hikes into areas and explaining and interpreting and evoking landscapes for people. That was defining, that was really defining. I'm very fortunate about that. That was, that was luck, that was a lottery and it changed my life. Uh, that led to the Forest Service, that led to grad school. My nature, um, I, was, I think I was born this way, is I'm curious about a lot of different things. So to your point about your listeners and, and, your, and our readers and our viewers or whatever we do here, always be curious. I think the greatest single animating mm -hmm. fact of life is I want to be around passionate people that are curious. Uh, I try to surround myself with them, people like you, people like Coulter, people like George Daly. You know, I can count them on one hand. I believe the greatest single gift humans have to offer on really hard problems is creativity and originality. So I don't care if I don't care so much about the degrees and the pedigree and the and all that. What I'm looking for is passion and inculcating passion. So there's a lot of ways, there's a lot of paths. And I have mm -hmm. been create, I've been able to be courageous enough and been in environments where. I don't try to take the path of least resistance, but I'm an interloper. I'm a classic <laughs> interdisciplinarian. Um, I like that interloper phrase, by the way, Alex. I'm going to use that. I often use interdisciplinary, cross-disciplinary, but that interloper, is it, it implies curiosity. It implies you're being curious about economics or history or other subjects that maybe you don't have a, a formal degree in, but yeah. you're curious about those, and you surround yourself with people that know deep content in those areas. Yeah, I, I like and, and I, exactly. And I think I think the, the trick about transdisciplinary, inter, whatever, there are different meanings to those words. If we if we look at our Latin and our Greek, we got that. But I knew a Jesuit told me a long time ago, Alex, the way you're looking at the world is that you can either go, you can be like the Platte River, you can be a mile wide and inch deep. So I went with breadth. <laughs> I went for breadth, not depth. Um, there are some areas I feel like I can go fairly deep on, but I, I wanted to be able to have enough confidence that I'm okay saying I don't know. I don't need to know. <clears throat> what I need to be able to do is communicate, to be creative, to be, to be curious. Now, the basis of inspiration, right? Inspiritus. If you look up the word, which is a very important word, geos inspiritus is... Um, it is a, a divine word. And in the sense of when you're inspired, you actually are breathing the word of God. Now, this is a very Judeo-Christian interpretation of the English language and the word insp inspire. But when you inspire someone or you're inspired, you literally, uh, metaphorically, I should say, are, you are you're, breathe, you're breathing in, you're consuming that which is divine. Now, I happen to find earth to be divine. Um, I don't, uh, the earth to me at a metaphysical level is mysterious. And mm -hmm. in the most phenomenological basis, it is, it is mysterious in a wondrous way. So beingness, I don't have to have explanations for everything. I don't need to reduce everything to a, an equation. I mm -hmm. believe there's mm -hmm. an appropriate tension between that which is both reason-based and then also uh, mysterious. So that's a long-winded way to get back to geo-inspiration. And I believe inspiration for me, 
in my career in, in academia and in, you know, lots of small businesses. And I've had a lot of different paths. I've been on a lot of different paths. I encourage young men and women to step outside the mundane, to step outside the norm. To, I was very fortunate that I was raised very Socratically in my education and to be okay not knowing and th through, through discovery with others, through dialogue, we can, we can achieve insights and dialectical explanations that we cannot do ourselves. So I, I believe that the challenges we face as humans are really hard. And I, I, I felt that a long time ago, the only way we were gonna address these complexities was through synthetic thinking and mutually enforced pathways for inspiration. And the beautiful thing about knowing a river, knowing a watershed, knowing um, our land is that it's a primal experience. If you, if, you, if you can stay connected to that which animates us and inspires us metaphysically, spiritually or otherwise, you have a grounding. And I, I was taught a long time ago, and I'll end with this, and this, you'll appreciate this. If we don't know where we've been, we technically don't know where we are and we, we're, we're lost. And if, and if you don't know where you are, you can't orient to where you wanna go. So I have found geography in all of its nuances to be both intellectually stimulating, but also spiritually satisfying in terms of that primal quest for orientation. Now, my job is to share that. My job is to inspire. And I, it's part of the reasons I love teaching. It's part of the reasons I dedicate a lot of my time to helping people, young men and women who are looking for the future. Because here's the thing. If I don't help that next person, then I'm not, I'm not being true to my obligations to help um, everybody else. And I'm a big believer, I uh, believe it or not. I'm a, I don't believe in zero sum games. I don't believe in, I, for me to win, you have to lose. I am a big fan of the commons and bringing it full circle to John Wesley Powell and his hydrographic units and his <laughs> radical notion for inhabiting the West, and which he studied by the way, by studying Native American lifeways and pathways. He believed in looking at landscapes and 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 making a rational approach to those things. So that's a really, really long-winded answer. Um, but that those are the things that I um, that ground me and uh, animate me. But but Joseph, it comes back to having opportunities to work with other people that are inspired. Give me a passionate person. I don't care if what you do, and that that's half the battle in life. I have found that the people in enviro, geo, geotech, biology, in this sphere, which touches on a lot of different disciplines, they are very keen on what you're saying. In other words, there, there was geo-mentorship even before geomentors.net existed you know even before the website existed with the partnership between you know aag and esri and and others to formalize this sort of hey mentor a school mentor a community college if you're a gis professional even before that it all happened people were already in this community very keen on and and actually not just saying this is a good idea but actually doing it they were practicing it and that's one of the things I've, I've valued about this community for a long time. I know you have as well. Another thing that's interesting that you're touching on already is that whole notion of we don't always have to be collecting data with our GIS field maps or Survey123 or our naturalist or any other tool that we choose or a noise app or whatever on the landscape. Yes, it's great, it's great and it's valuable that we have those tools. But we're always encouraging people, and just for the benefit of the listener, this is something that you and I touched on when we gave this co-keynote address at the North Dakota GIS conference. We had a lot of students in the audience from Bismarck State and elsewhere, UND. And what we, I remember one of the things that we said to them was, be out in the landscape and use, 
If you've got five senses, great, use them all. Just be out there appreciating, you know, touching on Muir and others' writings. To protect the land, we've got to first appreciate the complexity of and the sacredness of, as you're touching on earlier, of the land. And you don't always have to be collecting data. Sure, you're going to be sensing it, but you know, you don't have to be in a project. I think it's important for students, you know, Richard Louv talks about this too, last child in the woods, right? Get out there into a riparian zone or a, even a vacant lot outside, you know, uh, the block of your neighborhood or you know, some natural place is so important. I, I love what you're saying. And, and well, you know, it, I, I grew up next to a national monument. I've, I never worked in the field as much as you have, but I always had this dream that I actually could do that. And, and I've been very blessed in my career and having had all kinds of opportunities. And when I'm on work travel, you know, over the last decades, I've always made it a point, tack on an extra day where you're not teaching or presenting, you're actually going out there in the local area and just experiencing even ordinary landscapes. So you've, you've touched on a lot of really important things, but I think immersion in our, in our landscapes matters, you know, again, whether it was my mentor, Jeffrey Gritzner, my mentor, David McCloskey, uh, these are people that I respect, um, scholars, innovators, teachers. Being in the world, you know, is important and it's more important than ever. A lot of us, um, a lot of people today, you know, have grown up in urban geographies and for various reasons, haven't had an opportunity to maybe the only green they'll ever know is a park, if at best, and it might be full of crack vials or syringes and it might be a dangerous place. We all know for 20, 30 years beyond, we've known that being in the world is important. I think one of the reasons, you know, you were involved in this, Ezra was involved in this early on in Montana, you know, 20 plus years ago, we put a copy of GIS in every school in Montana. I was proud of that achievement with others mm -hmm. because what we wanted to do was use the tool, geographic information systems as a way of unpacking the world and, and creating a pathway for exploration. Um, I, you know, Jack Dangerman and I talked a long time ago about people walking across Africa, Lewis and Clark walking across the United States. When Kaplana Chala went up into space, you know, her last astronaut interview was about Lewis and Clark and, and being courageous to go in and to go out. I'm convinced as we get, as our, as mega cities grow and people are 30, 40, 50 million people in a city and we become disconnected um, and, and nature becomes an abstraction and we lose that fundamental. I know physiologically and psychologically, and we're now seeing data on this and we're seeing reports on this, the disorientation and the fragmentation and the alienation of people from nature is inherently unhealthy. Uh, we don't know how unhealthy it is, but it, it causes dis-ease, uh, psychological, physiological. So now more than ever, as we love our public lands to death, um, and we've had this sort of COVID reaction within a hundred, you know, a massive pandemic. Every place is full, every place is being explored. And we need to both cherish that, but we also have to protect the value of these landscapes as being transformative, as being regenerative. And now more than ever, as I was kind of babbling on earlier, we need to be very, um, we need to care for that which holds us and binds us together and Given the fragmentation and the hyperfragmentation of social media and all these things that we're seeing, what, what we need to do is be able to come together um, as people um, and as human beings, but to do it within the context of, of, a, of, a, of a natural state. It's important. Indeed. I knew we would get into many seeds that I hope for the listener will sprout into shrubs and trees and whole forests. <laughs> but we, we just sort of dove in right away into these fertile grounds. And I love this. I know you are always thinking ahead and you're a positive person. You've always been a, okay, a realist, knowing that as you're touching on, we've got some serious issues with water and equity and climate and so on and so forth. But considering all of those things and considering your own pathway and your vision for the future, what what do you think we need to be working on collectively as a community uh, in this 
uh, gosh, we're just at the beginning of this decade, but in some ways it, it feels like the decade is worn on for a long time, hasn't it? But on the other hand, here it is October of the current year that we're chatting and I'm thinking to myself and you probably are as well and maybe the listener, I've got a lot of things that I need to do even this year that I promised myself and promised other people I would do. So at the same time, so there's this whole tension between accelerating time and issues, but yet also being clear about we do have hope for the future. We have good people. We've got good data. We've got visionary people like yourself. What do you think we need to be doing and not distracted by? Because there's a lot of things we could be doing, right? I, I do hope we're planting a lot of seeds to continue uh, a fruitful discussion. And I think we are. And, and I, I tried, the more I talk or I write an article, or if someone has any interest in what I have to say, I try to, I do try to be both positive and inspirational. So I, I've, I think of myself in many ways as a, um, as an idealist, but I, I temper it with experience. So with limited time, the, the challenge we face in today's world as we've gone faster and faster and faster and we live in a, in a hyper acceleration space in human history, um, we have to decide what is important and what's meaningful and how to ground ourselves. I mean, there's probably 20 books written a day on how to be grounded. I, I don't think we need to reinvent the wheel there. I think we have to remember what we knew. Number two, distraction. Uh, if you look at the nature of addiction, um, you'll find a polyaddictive uh, theory is around whether you're spending nine hours on Instagram or you're at a casino or you're, you know, you're drinking 35 beers or whatever it is. Addiction in, in, in its most basic form is a, is a means of distraction. Distraction from the self and to basically lose oneself given the pain of circumstance. Could be trauma, it could be something that's too hard in your environment. It could be an overwhelming sense of disassociation. So the word distraction is a very important word and it kind of gets back to what I said. We have to find ways to help each other be less distracted. And I think that's why the world and that's why um, understanding our geography and knowing where your river is and knowing where you are uh, metaphorically, phenomenologically, and literally really matters. Knowing where you are reinforces knowing who you are. And we learn to be comfortable in the world and we learn to be comfortable with ourselves. If we can't do that, we can't have a relationship with others. So the, the great challenge in 2021, given hyperfragmentation, I'm, I'm worrying about the following things. And I'm trying to do something about it. I'm worrying about uh, if you look at a democracy and, and you think about what's so important in democracy, shared experience, civility, and knowing what is truth matters. So I'm, I'm more concerned than ever as an information technology guy, someone who had to learn that to do what I wanted to do. I, I, wasn't, I didn't start off to be a technologist. I started off to be a park ranger. At the end of the day, I'm worrying about, I worry about authenticity and truth and information. Now, more than ever, we have, every single day, we have hundreds of millions of independent realities created for us, and we've lost a shared common experience. That's really, the implications of this are significant, and I don't think we fully understand that. That's one. Two, we have to understand the implications of what we've already done in the last 340, 50 years in terms of putting up a lot of gas in the atmosphere. I don't really argue with people about climate change because I've studied it. Climate changes all the time. It's going to continue to change. What I'm worrying about are my daughter's daughters. And I worry about my friends' daughters, daughters, and sons. And they're, I'm worrying about the next 100 to 150 years. And what I mean by that is I wanna get scientists and engineers and all sorts of activists and people together. And I wanna unite about where, where do we wanna be as a species at, on the planet earth. Um, I don't really, I'm not that interested in going off to Mars and going off and colonizing to save the species. I get it, but I'm also kind of interested in what we're gonna do here. So mm -hmm. adaptation. 
I'm all about mitigation. I'm working on it hard. Uh, there's a personal responsibility share. So, so first of all is information truth. You know, you and I would know it as authoritative. You know, when, when I make a map, you make a map. We always wanted to know who made it the line, where did the line come from, and can I verify and validate its source? Mm -hmm. That was really important back in the day because maps can be powerful. They can deceive. They can lead. They mm -hmm. can, we can hide. We all know that. Okay, so truth, adaptational strategies given the, what's going on, and then thirdly, um, I'm I'm actually I get to, I've been in Montana a long time. I'm fortunate to be here. I think that local government matters. I think there's an abstraction with the federal government. I know it. I like it. I respect it. I have friends in government. I have a utmost respect for the federal government, state government. It's a it's a thankless job doing hard work given a lot of competing interests. But local government is the last form of government where you may run into your elected official on a given day. You go to school together. You buy food together. Mm -hmm. You play soccer games together. You, your you, kids are you, in the same. Yeah, your kids are going to be in the same school together. So I care about local scale. What was it? Aristotle talked about the fact that now this is ancient Greece, but if the philosopher king can't go to the hill and see his city, see the polis and take its full magnitude in, there's no hope for management. There's no help for governance. So I like, I'm, I'm kind of doubling down on local. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm doubling down on, on strategies for successful adaptation, water, food, energy, security. And then the third thing is I'm, I'm super concerned about information distraction and getting lost in the world of the nano. Because if, we, if we're disoriented around what we know, just like Plato's cave, then we're just looking at shadows of puppets on the cave wall. And we all know where that leads us. It does not lead to good things. So truth, and how do we get to truth? Two, adaptation, because that's very practical, very practical. And three, at scales that are both, that matter, that are effective, that are tangible, and people can feel like they're, they're not only are they making a difference, but they are, and we can share that inspiration. So those, those are the things I worry about. I worry about them all the time. And I, I'm trying to make a difference there uh, horribly and perfectly. And to wrap all that up, um, in my new position at MITRE, I'm, I'm kind of going back, Joseph, to being a naturalist interpreter. I want to convene. I want to bring together. I want to explain. And then, and then I'm a big, you know, part of the reason I'm a big, I'm a big fan of into action. You measure twice, you know, you measure twice, you cut once. We have, I don't think we need another 8,000 papers on what's happening. I love science. I get it. Mm -hmm. I think we need to start to worry about um, what are we, what are the, what are we going to do and, and how are we going to do it ethically and honestly and, and, and actually be respectful um, of each other as best we can. That's where I'm at. That keeps me busy. Well, I appreciate your honesty and, and your straightforward statements of, of these things. There's many things that come to mind. One, one of which, I'll just share two. One, your whole notion there at the, at the end of, of, and points about taking action and not research is good, et cetera, but I keep thinking about the, the geographic and scientific inquiry process. This is a, one of the reasons why you and I love geotechnologies. It's not learning how to buffer and learning how to geocode. I mean, those are all interesting tools and they help us to solve problems. But it's what you said at the beginning, being curious, asking a geographic or scientific question, uh, gathering the data, assessing the data. You touched on this too. It, is it, does it meet my needs? How, can it do, uh, how do I know if I can trust the data? Analyzing, coming up with the dashboard, a communication tool, story map, whatever it is that helps you communicate what you've learned and what you recommend, and then maybe take an act, taking action. That was the thing I was getting to is that we don't want to just do all this to gain head knowledge, right? We want to be able to take action about the urban greenway or about the invasive species or the pine beetle infestation or the wildfires or whatever it is, right? We want to actually put that knowledge into action. So that was one thing that came to mind, which you sparked in your comments. And then the second one, this is just a tiny example of what you're getting at with local government, but 
you know, I've got that spatial reserves data blog that came out of a book that a colleague and I wrote for Esri Press. And one of the things that we have in that blog every other week is how do I find data, spatial data? How do I know if it's any good? And then societal implications. And one of them touched on what you and I and others have talked about over the years, and that is that GIS has sort of evolved from this system of record to a system of engagement, engaging communities and engaging people and connecting people. One tiny example was my community, like many others now increasingly, have some sort of citizen science app or a way for citizens and people in the community to contribute. So, you know, being a, a cyclist, I decided to use that, my community's new cycling, you know, map app, and it has a, hey, submit your recommendations. So I, you know, this isn't something that a, a person on foot would care about, but there are certain places on a very steep part of the trail here in Colorado that I cycle on that, that are just wide enough, the gaps in the, in the pavement that, bam, you hit your bike tire on. Again, you wouldn't notice it if you're walking. So I, hey, okay, I'll use this as an experiment. I'll just submit my, you know, I had li very low expectations actually, given the, you know, the busyness of the people in my community and so on. Well, a couple of days later, I'm on the same trail and I see these paint markings. And a couple of days after that, someone had paved. So I actually then submitted another, hey, thank you so much for paving that piece of the trail. I really appreciate it. And I'm, I was overjoyed just in a tiny little example of, hey, we can through these, it's not just the tools, it's citizens being engaged and saying, hey, I've got the capability here. I've, I've, I've been in the field. So touching on your point of earlier about if I hadn't actually gone out into the landscape, I'd never would have noticed that that was a problem or an issue. So it was just a nice example, I thought of, Again, a very small one, admittedly, but you know, it made a big difference for me and hopefully other cyclists, especially on this steep part of the trail. It was the, uh, the National Geographic inspired and funded geographic alliances that uh, mm -hmm. right after I got out of working for the Forest Service or the Park Service and I came to University of Montana, uh, Dr. Grisner ran the geographic alliance in Montana. And I, next thing you know, I find myself taking teachers on hikes and doing immersion and getting them used to GIS. And then I was like, you know, we got to make it fair. Let's just figure out NASA. Can you please figure out how to put, buy a copy of arc view for every teacher and let's get them a data set. Let's just, let's just get, let's get, you know, I, I believe technology is techne. Techne means tool. Um, not everything is a nail if you have a hammer, but I, I don't run around if I want to build a house, I got to figure out what tools I need. It might be GIS, it might be GPS, it might be 45,000 satellites and whatever. It's more dizzying than ever. So to your point, the citizen scientists, I think we could just say in some way, I think we've over-specialized and, and I think we've created unnecessary elitism and hierarchy in how we know the world and how we are in the world. I mean, I, I don't get me wrong. I, I scientists are important, uh, engineers are important, but I think we've I think we've created an artificiality there. So the other thing I got involved in early on, which is a great experience, was NASA's Globe Program, mm -hmm. Global Learning and Observation to Benefit the Environment, which had a kit and it was affordable. And science students and teachers went out every day and they measured weather. Gosh knows that meteorological stations and understanding weather which we used to do all the time when we were more agrarian, you know, and a lot of, large part of the world are st still very agrarian. I mean, they, you know, they may exist and subsist on very poor water, you know, fuel, fuel collection on a daily basis. And, you know, Mozambique, maybe $200 a year in income and all the ways we measure growth and GDP is not happening for about a billion and a half people every day. I live on the extreme other end of it. So, Citizen scientists, so GLOBE was a good example. And I think we have a lot of examples of that. Project WET mm -hmm. is another national program. And you, you could go on and on as a, as a USGS geography educator. I mean, that's why I really loved you and what you were doing. You got it. And then, you know, you went on into your career now at Esri. So I believe that being in the world, you know, figuring out how to measure it, how to study it, that is a very practical way of caring and learning to care. 
if you don't, if, as you said earlier, if you don't experience, you're not going to care. If you can't study, you're not going to care. And it be, it, people begin to have skin in the game. And I will tell you that if we, learn, if we live in a world of abstraction and we live in a world of you never unplug from your phone or you, you live in a complete artificial metaverse or whatever the hell you know, Facebook has planned for us, um, it does not bode well for the species. I'm, I'm gonna tell you that right now. I mean, I'm, I'm at an age where I'm gonna make that bold statement. I just don't think it bodes well sociologically, psychologically, anthropologically. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that out. So you, you protect what you care and, 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 and being in the land, studying the land, you know, agriculturalists had to figure this out so they could survive and grow food. Well, now I go to the store and I get whatever I want, whenever I want, or I have a DoorDash delivered. So those disassociations from cause effect, from the very fundamental basic of understanding the world. And oh, by the way, I also think it hurts our ability to develop basic hypotheses about what's going on in the world, like relationships, like why is this happening? You know, a good hypothesis is is a is a is a statement based on observation that we look to test so we we run around proof we run around proving hypotheses we don't run around testing them so observation citizen science um i believe is incredibly important and it's in, it's very important in the classroom um whether you are in an urban environment or you're in a suburban environment or you're in a more rural environment, being out in the world, measuring, studying, observing, as you said earlier, all senses and, and learning to quantify, but also qualify, you're creating an emotional experience. And I, I'll say another thing I've learned in 30 years, the most effective brands, the most effective campaigns, the most effective moving needles, like getting 100 million people to move, I'm going to argue that it, it, you know, marketers and commercialization specialists figured this out a long time ago. They're, 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 they're playing on emotional events. They're, they're, um, they're emotive, they're emotive experiences. And I think that's why we've reduced our attention span to an average of about five, six seconds. And most of it, younger kids, you know, and the kids in the thirties and twenties and the teens, they know and learn through video. And you and I maybe are, I'll speak for myself, you know, it was more books and it was more reading and writing papers. So there's a, there's a direct vi visceral experience biochemically and electrochemically to video stimuli um, and that immersion process. Now that's a rabbit hole, I'm not gonna go down it, but I'm saying that being in the world across all landscape types, having confidence in ourselves to know that across the degrees of precision, there's, there's degrees here, but uh, the, most, the most satisfying things I've ever been involved in isn't just lecturing and sharing and teaching. It was, as a young man told me yesterday in a, in a class with NASA and, and really good scientists, it's science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics STEAM education, and how many books have been written, how many studies have mm -hmm. been done, I think you would know this a heck of a lot better than me, that by enabling and having expectation of youth to be able to rise to the occasion is the greatest form of empowerment and, 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 and shared responsibility we can have. So that's a really long-winded answer to I'm a huge advocate for what you just said. In a lot of ways, it relates back to local, um, bottom up, and and frankly, what you care you know you care for what you can measure and what you know and what you experience, and that's why access is so important. That's why um, citizen science programs are so important. I I I mean I think that's why geographic alliances were important. I think that's why Nat Geo was important. I think that's why these programs, because, um, and that's why I was involved in a lot of them. And I, you know, for a long time, and Joe, Joe, you know, Joseph, you know this. In fact, I was even involved in the NASA education effort 
because of that. But again, what I loved was working with guys like you at USGS and then industry and maybe you, because I'd like to combine all of us together from our different perspectives. And then we built great, you know, we, we built, I think we built maybe not great things, but we, you know, we were making a difference because, because gosh knows what happens now. You know, you've been to Montana a dozen times or more. You, you know, we did, you, you were there, you were supportive, you got it. You never know, as we were talking about thematically, how many seeds we did plant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I can, I can give you a few examples and those seeds grow, those people make a difference. And, and, you know, we might not have this huge needle movement of like some transformation metanoia experience, but I think it's, it's incremental growth and improvement around land ethic and, and how the land ethic reinforms our social ethic. I, I am a big fan and I'm a true believer. And I just, I just saw this yesterday in some studies in Mozambique. If you have an unhealthy ecosystem and ecological degradation, so goes your culture. And if you have an unhealthy culture um, in the sense of any, me any metric and any measure, you also will then usually find a degraded ecology. So the eco-cultural relationship, which geographers study all day long, that is a fundamental interwoven, um, I would say, sacred bond. And we have to be very careful about how we weave that together and how we maintain that fabric. It's as important as humus, you know, the soil structure, by the way, from mm -hmm. which the word human comes from. So we literally uh -huh. named ourselves after that, which is the very fabric of life, which is that three feet of soil, right? That we now realize is a micro universe of complexity. And so, you know, you can look anywhere, you can find the universe in a drop of water, you can find it in a cubic, a cube of soil and um, blah, blah, blah. So these are, these, these are things I think that are important from, from my perspective. <laughs> I think those are so well articulated, the points that you're raising, Alex. It, one of the things that you said, actually several things, remind me of the David Orr quote about we're only going to protect what we love. And you know, it kind of comes back to what we've been chatting about over these last moments about getting onto the landscape and how important that is at any age, even as adults. And another thing that came to mind, we're not just saying for the listener, you need to go out and do these things. We've, we've learned a lot from, from being involved in these kinds of projects ourselves. I remember when I met Alex, maybe not when I first met you, but one of the things that we were together on early on, you, you mentioned the NASA projects, EOS. This was back in the clunky days, folks. So think about having a group of educators online. What was it, Alex? 90, 1998, something like that. Online learning. So that was one thing. It, was, it wasn't easy to do. But we were learning about and we were using satellite imagery and GIS and, and looking at watersheds and population change and so on way back then, even though it wasn't easy to do technologically, these educators stuck with it. And it was a nice way of bringing the university slash community college folks together with the K-12 community. And I'll just share this because I could go on and on because it's one of the best things I've ever been involved with, with you or anyone for that matter. I, re I distinctly remember one of the participants being sort of even more than other people going out of this person's way to help others. And I finally emailed that person in our community, in that EOS community saying, hey, I really appreciate all the comments that you're giving to these educators. You know, what do you teach? And he said, Joseph, I'm a student. I I'm 15 or 14 or whatever he was. Remember? Yeah. And it was like, yeah, yeah. really? Yeah. Oh my gosh. And so one thing led to another there because of my, I was so impressed. We actually in one of our GIS educator institutes for K-12 educators in Boulder, we invited that student from Montana to come to Boulder. It was a big deal because he was only in high school. His parents were like, who are these people inviting you to Colorado? Can I trust them? And so the dad actually traveled with the son and the son was one of our student mentors to these teachers at this institute. So, and then that student went on to become uh, immersed in you know science and GIS. So it's just, like you said, those seeds and, and it was just, it was, there were so many things in, entwined in there, but one of them is that, you know, we're learning from each other and students can do this, right? You give them the tools, you give them a visionary educator, you give them just inspiration by you getting excited about this. Hey, you're 30, 40, 50 years old. You can get excited about this too. And it rubs off. 
and the students say, you know, it's okay if I get excited about it, even if none of my friends are, right? So anyway, yeah. that was, I love that story because it, it just intertwines so many things about, you know, innovation, get, get bringing people together through science and geotechnology. I think that student was James, and I think that he did go on to do remarkable things and work for a number of companies. You know, I hire, I've hired over the years some remarkable high school students at my companies that went on to do, I mean, they're starting companies. They're, they're you know, it, it, just, it just has to happen. We have to realize that a, a rising water level, all boats float mm -hmm. higher. I mean, again, I, I just yep. think this kind of comes down to understanding the commons and what's going on. And your point's right. You know, I can think of Dr. I think of Jackie McCann and now, you know, she was an early geographic alliance educator Then it was teach the teacher. She did. She spent 30 years in the classroom. You know, I know she's now down making a difference in the Peruvian Amazon. She's going to do good work there, kind of connecting local to local. You know, if we don't, you know, I think we all have a thousand views of the Amazon going away and the Congo and these challenges but where we have to move from observation and not, we have to, we're aware. So we're aware and then we know, and then we understand, and then we have to act and we have to act intelligently mm -hmm. and we have to look at the lark. Okay. So that's all true. Um, I'll give you another example. I, I was really happy because the last two days I was, I was in my new capacity at MITRE. I was, you know, I'm connecting really, really good researchers and scientists uh, from University of Montana and some degree Montana State uh, with MITRE and, and so that our customers, our sponsors, our government folks can have, you know, the, 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 right, the best available information and the best available application uh, we can. Okay, so in that, there was a young man I met, uh, 28, who uh, is, is part of a, 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 a lab at University of Montana that does two things. Well, first of all, they run, they're part of the NASA Space Grant Program, which again is emphasizing STEAM or STEM and really focusing on, it, on undergraduate education. So that early first peer-reviewed publication, pioneering research, you know, that kind of stuff we're looking for because of various reasons, like we got to be competitive and in all this stuff, but it, it transforms lives. So this group, the Borealis Group, which is part of Space Grant, which is high altitude ballooning, I'll just tell you the story. Um, my friend Jen Fowler ran it. She just got a job at NASA Langley. She's leaving Missoula. She's going to go to Langley, work on unmanned aerial systems. Jen is that type of person we've been talking about. She's passionate. She cares. She gives back. She works 75 hours a week. She makes a difference in people's lives. Get this. A group of students um, from University of Montana, Montana State, and others are, were the first group in the world's history um, out of the Atacama to fly a high altitude helium balloon with a radio song, the kind of stuff you and I love, up to 100,000 feet during the total eclipse. And it just so happens during that eclipse, I think last year during COVID, uh, running around the clock for a week, launching 100 balloons, they also happened to measure and observe an atmospheric river streaming into the Chilean highlands. So this data set of gravity wave anomaly, ex, uh, imp, imp, um, its correlation to total eclipse and its impact on a atmospheric river was captured by 10, 15 undergrad students at the right place, at the right time, with the right preparation, with the right level of inspiration. And I'm telling you, this launches 10, 20, 50, 70 careers, and is the stuff mm -hmm. that I find inspiring. You want to talk about geo-inspiration. By the way, those students published first time that's ever been done in the plant history of the planet. Very unique, very hard. It's like Joseph, you know, Kairos, right timing. It's, it's as if the world opened up for just a period and geographers, scientists, physicists, people were there to observe. But that is remarkable. And that is, that is 
hard work. You know, it's field work. You know what I mean? And I think we need more of that. And I, so I'm a big fan of STEAM. I'm a big fan of this. And I, I mentioned this to this young man who told me the story and presented all this yesterday. I was blown away. And I was proud that my MITRE colleagues were there and blah, blah, blah. That's what it's all about. Um, but what I really liked was the, my friend Jen Fowler and how she's built this team. She built a scientific engine. She built a field campaign team. And they laid it all out. But I'm convinced that if we, if we set expectations really low in the classroom or in the college or the undergrad or whatever, if mm -hmm. we go low in our expectations, students will meet us there mm -hmm. big time. But if we, if we nicely and professionally and carefully set the bar higher, maybe towards excellence, I, I believe students, I believe children or students have the ability more than capable to meet us at a higher bar. And I, I can tell you, there's examples of that. You know what I'm talking about. I know what I'm talking about. So for instance, Joseph, when we got a copy of ArcView 3.1, we loaded it on 200 out laptops. We got NASA to pay for it, bless their heart. USGS was there. You, National Park Service was there. And we begged Erdos Imagine to give us a satellite scene in Montana. And I begged the NASA satellite a guy up on the International Space Station to take pictures, Ed Lou. And we worked really, really hard to grill the, that together. We were giving those students and teachers the fuel, just the pieces, to allow them to be imaginative, to be creative, and then again, to be inspired. And, you know, it was no skin, you know, and it, and I think those are good investments, man. Mm -hmm. I don't think we need to think of that as just fluffy or, you know, education. Um, by the way, remember NASA Ed Aerospace Education Services Program out of Oklahoma State? They were there. Mm -hmm. We had it all. We had a good thing going. But it was UMAC. Creative. Yeah. Yeah, GeoMac. We had, a, we had a good thing going, but industry partnered. Um, industry was there for various reasons. Uh, government was there in a good way. And that's something I'm proud about with my tax dollars. And then finally, academia. Mm -hmm. And, you know, an academia in the sense of the educational mission. And, I, and so those are some really important points. I think it's something that you and I have connected on over many, many, many years. You have never seemed to me, frankly, in your professionalism and your passion, you've never seemed to me to be a person that, is a low bar kind of guy, and and I you know and I'll tell you, it's, it's one of the reasons I really enjoy working with you. I'd like to work with you more. And in my at where I am in my um, career, these are the people I want to surround myself with because I need that to be fueled. I need to be refueled because this is kind of a dance between extra extroversion and laying it all out there and then introversion, you know, for me, it's, it's, it's going back and forth. But if I don't have guys like you and Bob Coulter and George Daly and, you know, people that have, that are pl plowing the way, but also trying to create the next, the next generation to also be inspired and to lead, you know, I, I, I don't do this. I don't do this in isolation. I mean, this, that's not the point. I, I never have, I never will. And uh, so, you know, you, you got you to gotta know that you've made a big difference in my life and also in the lives of thousands and thousands and thousands of educators and students. And that's, you know, we need to do more of that. You know, we can't expect the younger generations that we've, you know, we've given a phone to and we said, go figure it out. That is not fair to them. That is, a, that is an absolute uh, betrayal of our obligations as adults and as leaders and as citizens, just to hand a phone to a nine-year-old and say, go figure it out. They're at the mercy of some very, very, very difficult algorithms. I think we all kind of know that now, but I don't think we really understand how, how much life has changed in five years, in the last 10 years. It, it, it is an unbelievably powerful change. And I, I don't think we fully appreciate that. I, I really don't think we do. When we're working with educators, our message is always, we admit that teaching with any technology-based system 
is more challenging than other methods of instruction. GIS is no exception. It is a system and the world is a complex place. So those two things coupled together alone make it challenging. But as you're indicating, it is infinitely worth doing. It's not easy. It's not the easiest course going forward. But as you were saying, it sets the bar high. It encourages students to not just learn and read about climate or watersheds or biomes or population change. They're grappling with the real data, right? Again, being critical of the data, where it came from and all that sort of thing, but they're doing the work of a demographer in some, at least some ways, or a climatologist or a landscape architect or whatever lessons we structure around those things. So that's, that's always been the appeal. But I think when we say, oh, this is easy. No, it's like you're saying uh, on the phone analogy, it's, it's not easy. And we recognize that. And I think that resonates with educators because you and I and others that are doing the you know, the promoting and the nurturing and the, the partnerships with these educators at, at whatever level they're at, that we recognize that there are challenges, especially in the last 18 months, one would argue. And they're dealing with all kinds of, you know, staff layoffs and students being, you know, having all kinds of issues with being cooped up at home and, and all the rest of it, right, that we could talk about. But even in these times, educators are innovating and they, the ones that let their students fly, right, university, tribal, community college, secondary, primary school, those students will fly and they will be the change agents that we need in society in the future. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, you know, I, I just have, I mean, and I, I, you know, I think this is a state, this is a statement I have about our society, but we, you know, you, you pay for what you value. And I, I, I mean, I don't get me wrong, but I know a lot about a society based on what we invest in. I mean, it's not rocket science. And I just looked at some statistics today and, the U.S. spends about $500 per person on a child in their first five years. And, you know, Norway is at 15000 And, you know, you have, you reap what you sow. So as somebody who believes in left of boom, left of this, left of that, you know, upstream thinking, right? I even started a company to get into that. You know, a pound of, a dollar now is a pound of prevention. And you just have to be thinking about these things. I have an utmost respect for teachers, but I do think our society undervalues them and we applaud this and that, but we, we, in some ways, we don't understand the fragility of, of this, and we don't really compensate teachers as well as we should. When we spend $400 million a year on a third baseman, um, you kind of understand where the money is and what we value. So societies pay for what they value, and I, I'll just leave it at that. Um, secondly, that's why I've, I've, I'd like to, and I still, and I have to, I got, I had some interns already at MITRE and I think it's important, you know, MITRE is a nonprofit. We care. Uh, the American taxpayer pays for a lot. We need to give back and we need to, it's not just to get better students or better employers and all that crap. It's because this really matters. Give me an educated citizen in the full sense of education, not 50 degrees, but a true education. And I have a chance at a democracy. Okay. Um, okay, that's one big broad statement. So teachers matter and I have the utmost respect for them. However, as I learned many, many years ago, not all teachers are built the same and not all of them have the same expectations. So I'll be just honest. If you're looking at, if everybody's just looking at some cookie cutter curriculum and, you know, I'll make my $45,000 a year, have my three months off and call it good and do the least amount necessary to inspire and lead and and educate, then, you know, you get what you pay for. So what we tried to do, at least historically, is we had some level of competition, we have some level of selection, and we felt that those that show up and suit up and, you know, and really put it in or were the ones that NASA wanted to invest in, the ones that, you know, we all tried to put, we tried to maximize our investments in leaders and then hoping that they would make a difference in their classrooms and then make a difference in their districts, et cetera. So I can't, I can't change everybody. I can't lead, you, know, you can lead all the horses to water, but we're not gonna make them drink. And you know, I, I think a long time ago, people found out the efficacy of citizen science, education-based collaboration and 
and programs and kits. I think we've gotten away from it a little bit more than I'd like. Another observation I wanted to make that is something that really frustrates me, right? So in 1999, 98, you know, one of my teams and a lot of, you know, a few other places on the planet, you know, we, we built an ARC IMS site, one of the first on the planet, mm -hmm. you know, it was hard. And, and, and we, you know, we tried to make an interactive web-based browser-based uh, map, put it on, put a map on the browser. And the first time I saw that, I was like, this is transformative. You know, I, I worked with Esri for years, usually about seven years ahead of Esri to get them to make ARC objects online. And now we have GIS in the cloud. And in my lifetime, your lifetime, we've seen an explosion. I, I mean, I, we could spend 15 more geo inspiration sessions talking about the implications of that. But what's been remarkable in some ways in terms of geographic information is, you know, we went from GIS, no one knows what it is, and now everybody runs around saying geospatial. We don't even know what that is. People, I had a guy tell me last week that I need a map. And he goes, maybe we should include, maybe we should do something in GIS and geospatial. So the, the lexicon and the verbiage and the jargon has become really watered down in some ways. Fine. Okay. The power of, ge of geographic analysis and the visualization component of that, in some ways, I feel like we've been stuck in a rut for quite a while. I mean, I really can't, I mean, I get the COVID dashboard and trillion hits, good. That's good. I, I get the transformation to telling stories online and, you know, the, the idea of the geo story, that's probably good. I've seen more adoption uh, and more federal government and state government agencies kind of getting mm -hmm. into geo stories and, you know, you know what I'm talking story about. Story maps and so on. Yeah, Story sure. maps and, you know, and, and all of it. Infographics but, and visualization. Yeah, 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 yeah. But but I feel like we've really we've kind of we've kind of we're not innovating anymore in some ways in the sense that more dashboards, more decision support. We I feel like in my career, if I built one, I built a thousand web-based apps, you know, and I've we've just chase the tech, Java's this, Java that, JSON this, G, you know, XML. We've, we've kind of created the geo network, but I don't know, I don't know what we need to do next to transform how we experience geospatial information. <laughs> We, we made a cartographic map. It was a precious item. It was, it, was a, it was something we rolled on a table and we used. And then we, we've progressed rapidly. You know, I can't even keep up, Joseph, with how many CubeSats, NanoSats, SmallSats, and mm -hmm. other missions and platforms are in the space. I mean, we're sending up 20 a day. I mean, you know, a group of students in high school can, can get funding and build a CubeSat and get it launched. I mean, this is remarkable. So we got more stuff everywhere. We're observing more. We've got a lot of stuff, but I feel like in some ways we're getting lost in the noise. Number two, I really wonder about how much decision support we're really doing. I don't see a lot of change in impact. I see a lot more noise. Um, and I mean by that, it, you know, I, we're kind of mm -hmm. getting lost in too much data. We're getting lost in too many things. And, and so I kind of keep coming back to Maybe we've done enough analysis in some instances. There's areas where we don't have any analysis. And I, I, I really am more interested in, 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 yeah, not just decision support, but uh, this is really hard for me to articulate. I feel like I'm kind of stuck here, but I, I, I think we need better, better ways of acting or helping act and then really being able to track um, the implications of those actions. Um, you know, you, you hear this all the time, right? What, what are the metrics and, what are, and how do we measure efficacy? Mm -hmm. And I, I get all that. And I'm not talking K-12 education scores. I'm talking like saving, <laughs> right. saving 700,000 acres of this or implementing restoration here or helping, you know, another 20 million people have clean drinking water. Things like Gates Foundation, people worry about. 
So I feel like in some ways we've been stagnated. We've been kind of become, we've become enamored with, with www.getmeaview.com. And we kind of are stuck here in our screens. And um, I don't know what the answer is. I, I, I alluded to it earlier that I, I think, you know, almost like we, we we're losing some emotional connection to our geographical, our geographical experiences. I think we've become conditioned to really powerful geo, you know, geospatial applications that help us navigate and do our lives and see things. But I'm not, I'm not convinced that it's helping us build a better world or, or uh, and what I mean by that is a more sustainable world, a more equitable world. I'm, 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 I'm a little bit concerned there. And I personally, professionally, I mean, the, the fixation on apps and, and apps and apps and apps, um, I feel like we're losing, I feel like I'm part of a, I feel like we're losing the forest for the trees. Okay, I'll, I'll pause there. You know, those are, yeah, th that's good food for thought. Um, and when you started talking about holistic views of the land, I finally figured out who I was thinking of. It's John Brinkerhoff Jackson, J.B. Jackson, who founded the oh, yeah. landscape in 1951. And I think it ran to the end of the 90s, maybe encouraging the the, the listener to review some of his articles and have meaningful field experiences. But yeah, your points are well taken. I mean, here I am working for a software company, right? But I'm, I feel like there is this tension in academia, maybe in greater society as well and other, that there's so much tool development. I need to step back and think about what do I want to pro uh, solve my old supervisor at the Census Bureau, when we were working on Tiger, just on a personal note, would say to me, and this, you know, I was 25, you know, in my first professional position, really. He said, Joseph, you need to sit back in your desk. This was in the 80s, okay? Put your feet up on the desk just to show you the times and think about what is most important. What are we trying to solve here? And, and many people at the, okay, a few people at the time that, were far more visionary than me saying, you know, what we're building here, this tiger system, you know, the first addressable street network is going to be way, way bigger than the census itself. It's going to have long-term implications. And I kind of got a it, tiny, did it ever. I know did it ever. a tiny sense of that, but anyway, the, the, the personal thing that I wanted to share here kind of, I think in some related ways to what you're saying is that we're not, and we need to purposefully do this kind of related on a technical note, build in those times where we're actually thinking about those Q2 times, you know, the, the Stephen Covey classes where he says you need to spend quadrant two time. It's not urgent. No one's breathing down your neck saying you need to do this tomorrow, but it's important. It's long-term yeah. important. That sector is really hard for myself, I can say, and perhaps a lot of others. And now it, it's even more challenging in some ways with teams and and you know ch uh, slack channels i mean you if you're not careful you're getting notices on a saturday night right hey yeah. you've got notice you've got overdue tasks in teams or in slack yeah. right and you yeah. and you haven't checked in with channel a or channel b in in two hours i i you know those tools can be useful but Again, it's do they detract us from the holistic thinking and the reflective thinking of what we really need to solve? So I think all yeah, your well, points I, are very I mean, good, I, Alex. I see a lot of stuff going on that's about can we versus should we? I'll tell you that. And we become a kind of a techn technocracy um, driven by unbelievable wealth uh, generation. And I it gets into... Uh, a significant hyper consumerism and hyper individualism, and I, that that is a very very significant trend, which again is reinforcing what I mentioned earlier, which is very well discussed now and is being observed. Uh, the psychological implication, the demographic implication. You know, changing subjects slightly. Um, I a good friend of mine who did work at NASA Education and was part of our efforts that you were involved in, uh, Don Scott. 
uh, wrote a book recently on George R. Stewart, the author of uh, Earth Abides. Uh huh. Yep. And I read Don Scott's biography of George R. Stewart. It has a great book on fire. Great naturalist. Great geographer. Great author. And you know the interesting thing about George R. Stewart as a as a as a as an example as a biography of being in the world, observing the world. Um, you know, kind of that classic Berkeley tradition. Yeah, is, Carl Sauer, et cetera. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. And, you know, in fact, in the biography of George R. Stewart is an interview with my, my mentor, Gritzner, who went to Berkeley and, and knew Carl Sauer. And, and, you know, I'm still dialoguing with that. It gets this, there's a theme here that we brought out, but I will say this. Now more than ever, we have, we, we have more powerful capabilities to observe and understand our world. And I think we need to take a serious look at how does that, how is that brought together in actionable ways? And what do we mean by that? And I'm using some language, you know, that is, I'm getting a little, I'm getting a little weak in my, in my descriptions here, but one thing I want to deposit is about five, well, maybe 10 years ago now, you know, back to your point, we hired a 15 year old who uh, into GCS and he was brilliant and he was teaching Java at Stanford and he was a valedictorian later at his high school and just a remarkable young man. And um, Jackson Smith is his name. And Jackson, I gave him a challenge and I, I was fascinated by augmented reality. And I was I, I was studying what was going on at Oxford and 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 and, uh, and Cambridge was was slam technology and computer vision and all that. And I I said to Jackson, "Hey Jackson, can you please use this code? And here's a tablet. This is like ten years ago now. And I want you to build three scenarios. I want you to build an augmented reality of wildland fire on the landscape on that hillside. I want you to build an AR of look down into the street." This is all happening now, but 10 years ago, it was a little bit unique. And I'm, I'm, almost, I'm convinced, um, Joseph, as, as geotechnologists, that the one thing we should be thinking about is how do we want to experience integrated spatial information and, and, and presentation? And I, I, I've said this before, um, and I think I mentioned it during the, uh, the keynote that we did together at North Dakota. I think I even gave some examples. I think mm -hmm. that the next leap forward is going to be um, some kind of going be, beyond the phone, beyond the tablet, beyond the desktop, beyond the monitors, and it's going to be something mobile, and it will be a hybridization of the synthetic geospatial uh, information and the actual landscape itself. And I mean, that's, that's not a very advanced statement. It was a few years ago, it's not now, but I, I feel like all I wanted to say, and I, you know, with all respect to every software company and everything, is I think we need to dig, dig a little deeper to think about how we will consume and experience and truly gain insight from these hundreds of thousands of dashboards and hundreds of thousands of apps that we have now successfully created. So I, I, we can put a pin in that, but I, I, I don't feel like I've seen the next wave. I don't know what that is over the horizon. And I, I think we need to think about that a little bit. It reminds me of something that I've sometimes been concerned about, and that is we are sharing data as never before. We're sharing maps and apps, as you touched on, as never before. I don't know how many thousands of things get put into ArcGIS Online daily. There are over 2 million story maps in existence right now. All good, all, nothing bad about any of that. Uh, quite a bit of good has come out of that. We're not sharing methods as much as we should. So if I, I see your wonderful study and I want to replicate it in my area and tweak some variables, there's been some articles about this, but by 2021, 
some of these articles have have stated we should be farther than we are on we're publishing an article do we actually share the methods that we used and have a data storehouse where someone can take exactly our data i mean there's all kinds of intellectual property issues that are woven in here lots of societal things that are valid concerns but in order to again grapple with these complex issues that you and i keep talking about the, those articles argue, and I think they make valid points about that. The point is not to publish articles and have your CV list grow. I, I know that's tied to our promotional system, you know, in, in higher ed and so on and so forth. And I understand all that, but they're making a case that we're not advancing the ability as fast as we should be given the problems that we face to solve those problems because we're not sharing the data that other people can take and and then advance the, the problem solving. So Yeah, right. Yeah. So you bring up a really, really, really big point. I mean, in academia, we have, you know, we have publisher parish, we've known that, and we've we've turned that into an industry. Um, publishing houses and academic journals, uh, you know, we've created incentivization structure around publish as many articles as you can. I think we have to ask ourselves about efficacy. I've been around academia long enough to know that our bibliographies and our prior research, um, we, we've forgotten more than we remember. So we're, we're literally, we're literally um, and I don't think this is a brand new phenomenon, but we, I work with young people that don't have any idea what we did 20 years ago. And it doesn't mean just because it's not yesterday doesn't mean it's not important. Uh, that is really, really challenging to continuity of knowledge and um, certainly not, not the least of which not being the reinvention of the wheel. When you and I started out, or at least when I was thinking about putting a map online, you know, the only thing really going on was MapQuest. You know, Esri didn't have any real plans to being in the cloud 20 years later, but they're there now. But I would say this, it's, it's unimaginable just in a short period of time, how we've done well in, in an explosion of content, as you said, but, and an explosion of, of peer-reviewed and non-peer-reviewed material. But when I was doing a data analysis and data mining of the, the NIH PubMed database, you know, there's a million, seven million, eight articles in there, 50,000 a day get put up. You know, we were, we were having to build machines we were having to build algorithms to find the things we needed to know so that we could we could make a difference. So I, I guess it gets kind of back to my point. I feel like we become obsessed with volume and, and I, I think we're sacrificing quality for quantity. And out of that, um, out of that pipeline, if you will, um, I don't need 35,000 websites. I'm what I'm what I'm looking for is authoritative. I'm looking for trusted. I'm and oh by the way, Joseph, remember how we talked about federated architectures with GIS? Mm -hmm. well, what happened to that? Why is it that in 2021, when I build you know a million dollar system linking together all the all the JavaScript APIs and the JSON endpoints, why is it that that is not that's so fragile even today? You know, my good friends at USGS or US Fish and Wildlife Service or NOAA or NASA, why is it that we haven't evolved a truly elastic, um, resilient way of building federated GIS? I mean, I think it's I think it's a little I think it's a little crazy. And oh, by the way, God bless them. Uh, we now have cloud wars. So you know, Amazon needs to own the space, Microsoft needs to own the space, IBM, Google, Alibaba, blah, 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 blah. We're spending a lot of money, but I, but at the end of the day, Joseph, when I need an answer, a qualitative answer, or as you pointed out, a methodology, an analytic, or something to that effect, I, I feel like more than ever, um, I don't have, we haven't built enough intelligence, something I talked about a long time ago, smart data. I don't feel like we've built enough intelligence into our, our systems 
in order for the machine to actually help us do our work. I mean, FEMA is struggling to try to figure out how to do a little bit better job with floodplain planning. Uh, USGS has spent, I uh, talked to a USGS guy the other day, you know, they've spent $10 billion over a period of time on water quality assessment. USGS doesn't even know where it all is, first of all. And then, you know, we've got this and that. So some of the things I thought we were going to do when we got it, when we exploded on the internet, you know, we started building interactive map. Mm -hmm. I mean, my whole PhD was on distributed GIS. Um, mm -hmm. We didn't build in enough intelligence about the nodes and about the services and about the analytics to actually make it work for us. We just created a massive, you know, sort of giga, giga encyclopedia of stuff. And I, and I don't think our search tool, I think we, we stayed in search mode and we didn't get into, we didn't get into what I wanted to do, which was this whole idea of self-replicating uh, uh, you know, truly automated ways in which, you know, if I want to go learn about this area, um, I shouldn't have to be searching for 35 services or going finding the all the mm -hmm. stuff and put it in ARC Online. I mean, it's still not that easy. I, I wanted it to be a little bit more, I wanted it to be smarter. Okay, now you you kind of resurrected in this discussion stuff I used to worry about or I tried to work on a lot. I'm just now back in a point in my career uh, where I'd like to kind of pursue some of that. To be honest with you, Joseph, I haven't had a chance to talk to anybody about it in a while, you know, to kind of figure out what that next horizon is in our, you know, in sort of our geo constellations, if you will, if that makes sense. Yes. And one, well, one of the purposes of this series is to plant ideas in people's minds about things we need to work on. And so, I think your points are good for challenging people that, hey, it's 2021 and all is rosy in the world of data, data science, geospatial technology. No, there are things that we need to work on. And another of, of the things that you raised reminds me of the Mark Twain quote that I usually use when I'm teaching story mapping or some other ways to communicate with maps. And that is, he said, if I would have had more time, I would have made that novel shorter. <laughs> I love it because it's, it's, it reminds us all, hopefully, of you know, a term paper where we had to write our master's thesis, our dissertation, where your advisor is saying, okay, that's, a good, that's good that you've got those hopes and dreams. But remember, make it doable. Make it shorter. Focus, focus, focus. So I really like the Twain quote. It's like it, it touches on what you were saying in another way, and that is more is not not only is it not always better, it is seldom better just to add more layers, more, you know, that, 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 that there's a lot of other uh, life analogies to more is not always better, right? But I mean, you can overdo anything, exercise even, right? So anyway, the point is, I think you're you're bringing up some valid things for people to chew on here, which is the whole point of this um, interview. And with that, we probably should, even though we could go on, um, <laughs> you and I probably should close off this Geo Inspirations interview discussion. Hopefully um, the, the listener got some inkling of why I was so excited to have Alex Philp on with us today. Alex, thanks so much. Really appreciate all the things that you shared and for the, the leader that you are in the field. Well, Joseph, you know, thank, that's a really nice compliment, and I, I appreciate it. And I, I, I want to thank you for considering me for for your for this podcast. You know, I just really get a lot out of these conversations. Um, you know, uh, and and then being able to share them. But you know, geo inspiration is is a really important word, as we were talking about earlier. And you know, to kind of close out here, I think. Technically, I personally feel like we're a little stagnant. I, I thought we'd be further along in intelligence and smart data and, and kind of this, some of these ideas of, of really taking advantage of metadata a lot more than data itself. Uh, we talked about that at the very end. In the middle, I think we talked a lot about models of efficacy for learning, 
and and what does that mean for geography education and inspiration and and things that I've cared about, you've cared about. We've we've spent all our careers in some ways being involved in that. Whether we hire, we learn, we teach, you know that matters. And then finally, all the way back uh, to the very beginning of of where we are as a society and the things I'm worrying about and I'm working on. Um, I'm trying to build, you know, inner relationships and things. And so adaptational focus, uh, the value of scale. For me, geography informs all of that. And we never can lose sight of our responsibility to be there for the, for the, for the next generation and take the time, not just to put, you know, put our feet up on the desk and think a little bit about what the hell we're doing but also take the time, spend the time, spend the money, whatever. Because I, again, our, uh, we, we pay for what we value. And I, and I think we really need to think about that. And I, again, thank you so much for this. I appreciate it very much. And it, it was good to spend some time with you as always. Very much appreciate it. Look forward to further collaborations with you. Mm-hmm.